Pike, Michael Brandon takes on a very different role. Why'd you pick me up? You look like you could use a ride. What is it you're running away from? We just shut up! I'll scream! I'll scream! She can run, but she can't hide in Hitchhike, the Thursday movie at 7.30 on Central. And just, we have, just ahead of Farmhouse Kitchen, this is how the rest of Thursday looks. And watch out for those girls on top making mischief yet again at 9 o'clock. be back with you on Farmhouse Kitchen. There are umpteen different kinds of pastry, from the rich and exotic, the ground almonds and butter and egg yolks, to the simple everyday short crust. But one of the oldest and least used is hot water pastry, or hot water crust as it's sometimes called. Its texture is crisp rather than crumbly, and it still survives and flourishes in Scotland's famous bakery shops. Further south, it's used for traditional pork pies like this beauty here, served with the traditional pickled onions. Over here, I also have the small version, the same recipe. You can get three of these for this mixture in little pots. And in the middle, this lovely one done in an oblong tin with little eggs in the middle. Don't it, doesn't it look nice? And at the front here, some of Forfur's Bridies. I'll tell you all about these later. And at the back here, some of Scotland's traditional uh, pies that I brought down just to show you. And over here, the same sort of pastry used for fruit tarts, the rhubarb ones and the apple ones. But here's my version of the rhubarb ones here, served with some nice whipped cream. And the same pastry is used in this lovely almond tart, and that's the whole quantity there. And the little ones, which you can make with the same recipe, are very delicious they are too. Hot water crust appears in book one of the three farmhouse kitchen paperbacks and can also be found in this big book which contains nearly all the recipes we've ever used. Today's programme is no special use for the microwave but there are, if there are any hints for microwave owners I'll drop them in as I go along and we'll tell you also how to send for the paperbacks at the end of the programme. Now I'll make the pork pie a recipe first used in this programme by Dorothy Slighthome in 1970. Now in the pan here, I've already got four fluid ounces of water and melting in it four ounces of lard. Now any kind of lard works. This is a refined one or a very ordinary one. And you bring it to the boil gently, and it is important that you do it gently because it does tend to spit spits in. It's really melted, so I'll put it on one side and start telling you about the flour. In the bowl here, I've got 10 ounces of strong flour. Now, that's the flour that you use for making bread with a strong gluten content. And I want to put a little salt in that to flavor, because the pastry should have a little taste of salt. Sieve it through, and then into the, this flour, I'm going to pour the melted lard and water. And it's the simplest pastry you can imagine. Very easy to do, and if you've ever thought you're very ham-fisted when you're making pastry, you'll manage this very nicely. I make a hole in the center, a well, and I'm going to mix it together with a little short wooden spoon. And here's my melted boiling fat and water. Don't pour it in too furiously. Do it gently, because it does tend to boil up a little bit. You can see it boiling, can't you? Now stir the flour around. At this point, you'll be saying, how on earth is that ever going to be in pastry? But you'll soon see that it coagulates together very quickly so that you're aiming for quite a soft, dewy texture. And it goes. And use the wooden spoon because it's still quite hot, but it soon cools down once you start uh, rolling it out. There we are. We're just about ready to do it with the hand. and pull it round the side and the flour, pick it all up as you, and knead it. 
quite vigorously. You don't need to be gentle with it. You don't even have to roll it very gently. You can be quite vigorous with it. I'm aiming for a very smooth result. That's what I'm turning it over and over and over. There we have it, about ready for it. Turning out onto a really liberally flowered board. You really do need a lot of flour when you're doing this, rolling it out. And I'll give it a little roll back and forwards. And again, you see how it absorbs the flour very quickly. What I have to do now is cut off about a third so that I can leave it aside for a lid. I have a friend who likes to leave her pastry uh, for quite a while before she works it. She finds it's easier, but you can do it just straight away. So one third off for the lid, and put that there, and roll this out into a nice big circle. Now here's my rolling pin. It's quite a, a dull sort of colour, isn't it? That's the fat in it, the lard. But it does turn out to be a wonderfully crisp, bright brown colour once it's been baked and there's a nice uh, egg coating as well because we, beat, we do it with beaten egg. Well, I've broken that. It doesn't really matter. We'll give it another roll. Off it goes. You can see how pliable it is and soft and um, it's quite easy to handle when you're doing shapes as well. I'm going to do little tartlets later on and you'll see how easy it is to, to work. Now here we've got a fairly biggish circle. So I'll fold it roughly into four into a fan shape and here's the tin I'm going to use. And it's a loose bottom tin and you saw me greasing it earlier on. So put this in the bottom what I'm doing is aiming to get this pastry up across the bottom and up the sides in a nice, even layer. And you can see it's going to take me a minute or two to do that. So while I'm working this, have a look at the front there at the pins that I've put out for you to see. One of them is a lovely old-fashioned one with a hinge that a friend lent me. And next to it, a small one. And of course, you can use a loose bottom cake tin. That's a very uh, nice thing, easy thing to use. And at the side there, there's an oblong loaf tin. Now, that one makes a nice long shape, which is nice, easy to cut. I find that a very good one for slicing. I'm still maneuvering this round here, trying to get the up to the top of the tin. So have a look at one, two other ways of shaping a pie. Long ago, they didn't have any tins, and they used hand-raised method. That is, they put the dough on the middle of the table, put their fist into it, and worked it up round their hand. So this is another way of doing it, using an upturned jam jar and moulding the pastry around the bottom of the jar, allowing it to set, and then you take it off and support the sides with a bit of paper while it's cooking. And this is yet another way, and if you're uh, interested in pottery, you'll recognise this method of building up a shape. And then once you've got the coils wound round, you smooth all the pastry together and you've got your nice shape. Now here I am, I've got the pastry right to the top. It's still quite warm, so it's easy to handle. And by the way, if it does get cool while you're working in it, five seconds in the microwave will help to soften the pastry very easily. Up it goes. Now, the next thing is to get the pork. And here it is in the bowl here. One pound of shoulder pork. And I've cut it up into sizes about the size of a raisin. Don't be too ruthless about cutting off all the fat. You really do need it for flavor. So I've got to season this now. And a little salt. And the seasoning of pork pies was very much something that was often um, a secret. People had very special seasoning, especially butchers that they, and they did, they used cinnamon and ginger. But I'm using mace, which is one of the very traditional uh, flavorings for meat uh, long ago. And there's a quarter of a level teaspoon of ground mace, and that's the outer core of a nutmeg. So in that goes. Quite a bright yellow color, isn't it? So we must fork the seasonings through. And then we're ready to turn it into the pie. Oh, this one got escaped a bit, didn't it? Now, there's 
practice, and it goes. Now, at this point, you could actually substitute some of the pork uh, with a smoky bacon to give it another flavor. In fact, I think a lot of the pork pies nowadays are so very seasoned that we've almost lost the flavor of real pork. Now, there it is, ready for the lid to go on. So we'll push that just there and get a little bit more flour and roll out the pastry with the lid. It has been sitting here. Well, I found a, a pot lid that will just about be the right size for my pork pie, so I'll use that to cut it as a cutter. You see how sticky it is. So keep on putting plenty of flour onto it. There. Now here's my lid, which is just about the right size for the uh, pork pie. We'll use it as a, a cutter. There we are. Now, before I put that on, I want to wet the inside of that with some beaten egg. I've got a little egg beaten up here. I'm going to use that egg for painting the outside of the pie before it goes into the oven. In fact, a lot of people are very keen on very shiny, yellow uh, glazed pie. What they do, they keep taking the pie out at the, near the end and giving it another glaze of yellow egg yolk. So press it together. There we are. And use a fork or something else to make a decorative edge all the way around. Now, lots of pork pies have a nice decorative top to them, and I'm, this is no exception, so I'm going to make a big hole here to let the steam out, and a friend of mine puts a little cardboard funnel in there to make sure that that stays open. But have a look here at the little leaves that I've made, just used with pastry, cut very thin, you see what I've done, and then marked them. With, with little uh, veins to simulate leaves. So we'll brush that all over with the egg yolk and the, it's the whole egg I've got here, but if you want it really yellow, just use the egg yolk with a little drop of milk. Now the leaves we'll put round. Of course, if you're very artistic, you could do all sorts of things with this. But leaves are fairly traditional. Now, instead of a, a cardboard funnel, I'm going to put a little tassel, which I've already prepared. If you have a look at my bit of pastry there, I want to roll it up and pull the leaves out a wee bit and push it in the centre. And that wants another coat so that it's lovely and glazed when it's cooking. There we are. Now that's ready for baking, and I want to lay it on a, a tray because it's really easier to handle and put in and out of the oven. Now there it is, ready for cooking, and it goes into a moderately hot oven. Gas 6, 400 Fahrenheit, 200 centigrade for half an hour. And then to stop it browning too quickly, reduce that heat to gas 5, 375 Fahrenheit, 190 centigrade for a further hour more and your pie will be finished cooking and ready for the next stage which is the savoury jelly which is a very traditional part of pork pie. It has to have this lovely jelly inside to make it finished I think and it makes it helps it to cut more easily as well. Now in the old days you would always use a pig's trotter for this jelly and here's our pig's trotter here and I'd put that in a pan with a bay leaf and half a dozen peppercorns and a pint of water. And that would be simmered for a good long two and a half to three hours until you got a good strong jelly such as I have here. See what I mean? And that's the way it should be to pour it because when that pours into the warm pie, it settles down through the whole pie and then firms up and makes it very nice for cutting. But I've already got 
some melted in the jug here, ready to go into my hot pie. So here it is. I've taken it out of the oven and let it sit for about 10 or 15 minutes. And I've eased out the little tassel so that I've got a nice hole here for the funnel. Now, did, maybe you heard me saying early on not to press the meat down too hard when you're putting the meat into the pastry. And this is the reason, so that the jellied, savoury jelly can percolate right through. Do it a very little at a time so that it uh, goes in easily. And a pie about that size would take at least a quarter pint of jelly. And once that's in, you can replace the tassel, settle it down, and I like to keep it in a cool place, not a fridge. I think the, it's, the texture's nicer when you keep it in maybe a cold room or if you're lucky enough to have a cold larder. And there it is, ready for the centerpiece of your table. Now just have a look, lastly, at my two pies at the front here. This is one I've done with whole wheat flour, the healthy flour that we're trying to get you to use. And you can see that it is a bit darker but it works very well with this pastry. It is easy to get it into a nice smooth and thin pastry. It doesn't have to be heavy and, and you know, an inch thick. It looks very handsome, I think. And this one, um, I read that it'd be quite a, uh, it, it is a good tip to make the pie up and freeze it raw and then cook it the day before you're going to use it. And you see what happened to it. It did get a bit of a waste on it, but it worked very well. So if you were having a party, you could make one up all ready to cook, put it in the freezer until the day before you want it, and take it out and cook it, and it would be beautifully fresh on the day that you needed it. So that's pork pies. Now I'm going on to four for bridies and the fruit pies. Both these recipes are not given as separate recipes in our books, but you'll see how easy they are to make with this hot water crust. Well, what is a forfer bridey? Well, it's just another way of enclosing a savoury mixture in a pastry. And forfer is a small, very nice market town, very near my hometown of Dundee. And bridey was said to be a Maggie bridey who first made these long ago. I'm not saying that's the real story, but that's a very nice one. Here I've got the pastry rolled out quite thin. And the unusual shape of these uh, pastry parcels is fan shape. So I've got a paper pattern here to cut around it. When I look at it, it's not unlike the new pita bread, the, you know, the shape of it. But um, you can cut this quite thin. Oh, it's got cotton there. And round it goes. Now the savoury filling that I'm using is mince, minced beef, which I've just cooked and no more and a little bit of onion in it so that it can go on cooking in the, the pastry case. A butcher that I know in Forfar told me that he doesn't put economical mince into his Forfar bridies, he puts proper chopped steak in. So you probably pay a bit more for that. But there it is. In half one side of the parcel, and I want to wet this round the edges so that it will seal together all the way around and fold it over and press it down to get that unusual shape. And you can see what a nice handy shape it is to eat and to hold. And you can fork it round all the way to make it look even more attractive. But you must put a little hole in the pastry to let the steam out. And I remember when I was young that they sold these in Dundee with uh, a little mark on the surface that told you whether or not it had onion in, they were sold with onion and without. It was either savoury or plain. So that's ready for baking and it goes on to a greased t uh, t t tin. There it is there. And it goes into a moderately hot oven again. Gas 6, 400 degrees Fahrenheit, 200 degrees centigrade for about 15 minutes. And you can eat them hot and they're perfectly nice cold. And here are some finished ones over here. So have a look at the inside and see what the inside of a forfer bridey should look like. And there it is. I hope you'll try it. Now I'm going to use the pastry again, but this time doing something sweet, fruit tarts. And here they are over here. I've got my pastry 
rolled out, almost ready for uh, trimming, and I've got actually quite a lot of the tarts prepared. Now you can see that I've got quite a lot of flour on here, and it is necessary because the pastry itself is so sticky. Now the big, uh, the little tartlet tins I have here, quite deep, so that I can get a lot of fruit in them, and the, the I've got about a four-inch ring to cut it, uh, a circle for the base. Put it in gently. Try not to poke your finger in too hard in case the pastry breaks. Down it goes. And it's always a bit more fiddly to do a deep uh, fruit pie like this. Now, you probably noticed that they bought ones for, that I brought from Scotland. They're straight-sided, and they, the shapes are, are done with a machine to get them that nice shape. So they're that ready for rhubarb, which I've got here. And you'll notice that they, uh, I've got a frozen pack, just to remind me to say to you that rhubarb is very, very easy to freeze. If you cut it early enough in the season or draw it up under a bucket, I expect you know about that. Cut it, wipe it, cut it in inch-long pieces, straight into a bag, straight into the freezer, and there you are, all ready for uh, middle of winter. Lovely fruity tart. So we'll put some in here, put plenty in. And then the lid goes on, but don't throw it down the side like that. One of the great things about this pastry, because it's brittle, it doesn't absorb the juice the way a short crust pastry does, so that it's very suitable for fruit tarts, and they're much more moist inside. I've got a nice scalloped um, cutter here for the edge. I've got rather a lot of flour on there. Here's my brush. So I'll just brush the edge and put it over the top and the other one. A little, that could be done with water, it doesn't have to be with egg, but we're going to put an egg glaze over the top of the tart to make it nice and shiny. And also, of course, put a nice opening to let the steam out. And I usually do that with a pair of scissors make it easy. There we are. A little, and push it up so that you have a little pointed bit. So there you have, very nice rhubarb tarts. And of course you can do the same with gooseberries or apples, any fruit you like. It works very nicely. And here are the finished ones over here. And you can eat it just with a pudding. You could eat it uh, with a dollop of cream or as an afternoon tea dish. I'm sure you can look how nice and juicy they are. A bit of cream, make it even more special. There you are, fruity tarts. Now, they also are cooked at the same temperature as the other ones, moderately hot oven, gas 6, 400 Fahrenheit, 200 centigrade, for 12 to 15 minutes until lightly browned. Now, I'm going on to make almond tart. And this is an economical recipe given to us by Mrs. Evelyn Taylor of Flixton in Manchester. Now in the pan I've already melted two ounces of butter and two ounces of granulated sugar. And to that I'm adding two ounces of semolina. I did tell you it was economical. Now it is important to cook that semolina for two or three minutes so that the grains burst really thoroughly and then it has to cool down for a little while. So that's why I've got another pan here where the semolina has already cooked and the semolina is ready for the rest of the ingredients. And they are a teaspoon of almond essence, and that's where we get the flavoring, almond flavoring or almond essence, and half a teaspoon of baking powder. And to that, one beaten egg. Don't add it all at once because you want to get it nice and smooth. Round it goes. And that mixture is ready now to go into my hot water uh, paste crust, which I've got laid out here in a nice fluted tin, rolled out fairly thin, and pour it in after I've put some jam in the bottom. Just a little bit of jam to cover this. Don't put too much in because you don't want to cover up the flavor of the almond. So in goes the jam, and then the almond goes in. And that will make one lovely big eight-inch tart or about a dozen very small tarts, just like the ones you can see at the front there. Smooth it over so that you're covering up the jam. 
and then that goes into a moderately hot oven the same temperatures again as we've been using all day today gas mark six 400 degrees fahrenheit 200 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes for that one big tart or if you're doing these nice little ones 15 minutes is all they'll take to bake and here it is finished there now next time my guest is a young neighbor of mine from rawcliffe near Goul. she's pauline sykes and she's a very keen cake decorator so i'll be baking some cakes and she will be making a delightful ice cake for a small child's birthday party i hope you'll join us bye bye for now Farmhouse Kitchen books 1, 2 and 3 are still available at £2.55 each, including postage and packing. And our new microwave cookbook is now available, priced £2.95, including postage and packing. All of the books are available from bookshops and newsagents or can be obtained by sending a cheque or postal order to Farmhouse Kitchen, Admail 35, Leeds, LS3, 1, XY. In the two of us on Central on Friday night, there's a problem for the two of them. You can't expect us to come down for the weekend when you make Elaine stay in a bed and breakfast. <laughs> so father changes the house rules. On condition that there's no hanky-panky on the premises. <laughs> you know what that means, don't you? Yeah. Do it quietly. <laughs> but you won't know what that means till you watch the two of us Fridays at 8.30 on Central. Some excellent stars there and a very good script as well. Now, if you're looking for a job at the moment, don't forget our job finder service. It's been extended. You can see it, of course, after close down as usual. But we've now got an extra one early in the morning, especially for you early risers. It's at a quarter past five weekdays and 5.55 weekends. That's a job finder just before TVAM right here on Central. Back to the programmes coming up next. And we're off to Glendarroch for Take the High Road. To make sure our new Chinese chicken stir-fry meal was exactly right, we at Ross travelled east to the Golden Dragon for the ultimate test. More chicken than our mama and have on dinner. Oh, plenty vegetable, tasty bean sprouts. Very, very excellent. We expected a good reception. Too excellent. Who is Ross? We be ruined. <laughs> but not this good. We are the Rosa. <laughs> We rolls out! We rolls out! Chinese chicken. Get Ross! Just one of a range of Ross stir-fry meals. Delectable with a capital R. Somebody somewhere is having a toffee crisp. There you are. Oh, oh. Trouble, doll? You try getting into early learning. I will try it my way. Hi! Hi! Some hi. toys will never get into early learning because we only have toys that make learning fun. No tanks? No guns? Yeah, some toy shop, huh? Attack! <laughs> Early learning centers. We can teach other toy shops a thing or two. I want to see my lawyer. There's only one way to sample unique Cheltenham Racecourse atmosphere. Come along to the Mackerson Gold Cup on Saturday, November the 8th. There's a lot of it because there's a lot in it. This week's TV Times has something for everybody. Vivacious, volatile, yet vulnerable. Read part two of the Pat Phoenix story. 
Edward Woodward tells about his success on American television as The Equalizer. Secrets of a Miss World contestant. Hundreds of TV quiz games to be won. The Wurzel Gummages take the lid off country cooking. There's a lot of it because there's a lot in it. Don't miss TV Times this week. Guess what's on Central, Sundays at 7.15. Well, you see, these children come on and they try to explain a word without actually mentioning it. And the panel have to guess what the word was. Some of them do quite well, but some make a right mess of it. Child's Play, Sunday, 7.15. Whoops. It's just gone 3 o'clock and this is Central with Take the High Road. Eddie's back yet. It's time to go and get the children from Ochtan. No, no, no. He'll hide away for the rest of the day, like his wounds. Give him a bit of time, a bit of space. He'll be okay. <laughs> I suppose he isn't. What are you going to do then? I am not going to do anything. Look, you see, fit flange A into slot B, then cut along the dotted line. No, I've done that twice already. Listen, I think you should have a word with sorry. No, it's too early to bring sorry into it. He's at his employer, after all. All the more reason, then, for letting him know that he might have a problem in his hand. What problem? Look, if Eddie doesn't get back to the ferry tomorrow, then it's up to Sorry to find a replacement. Let a push. I can run the ferry for a day or two. You're making a big mistake, Brian. Sorry is just as fond of Eddie as you are, and he's got a right to know. Ah, you're a persistent creature. All right, see if you can contact Sorry at the Octan or the Marina. Yeah. I'll go round and see if Eddie's back yet. Come on, Morag. You have to admit it wasn't a nice thing to do. Oh, he'll live. Well, I think it was pretty rotten of Heather McNeil to lead him up the garden path like that and then just leave him in the lurch. I don't think we have to worry too much about Augie. He'll not be down for long. He's the sort that always bounces back. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he's bouncing back somewhere already. Mm, I suppose you're right. <laughs> 